Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Uh, I want to talk to you about Speak Life. Um, I wore my Breaking Bad t-shirt tonight for a reason because... Uh, it symbolizes what are the constituents of a chemical reaction. Of this amazing issue, not just, in, um, not just in chemistry, but in many, many other issues of life, where when two things meet, there is a reaction, and the reaction changes the nature of the two things as they were individually before they came together, and creates something fresh, and there are things that, that create irresistible reactions when they're brought together. I want to talk to you about two of those things tonight that create an irresistible reaction when they're brought together. Now, stars, we've said a bit about stars, haven't we? Sun and stars. I'm on it again, because it helps me to illustrate something. Okay, so, the North Star. If you're an Aussie or a New Zealander, it will be the Southern Cross for, for you guys. Um, North Star. The North Star is, is 433.8 light years away from Earth. And the point 0.8 is very important, though. Any of you short measuring this? 433.8 light years from Earth. That means that it takes the light from the North Star 433.8 years, 433 years and 8 months to get to Earth. So that's the most well-known star from which historically we have determined our position, particularly in the time of ancient mariners when we were looking to set our course, the course was set by finding the North Star and then navigating according to the light of the North Star. However, the principle here is that we have an observable event affecting the present that happened in the past because Every time you look up and see the North Star, you're seeing something that happened 433.8 years ago. Now, so how does that all work? Don't ask me. I'm not a scientist, but it's true. How can you see something in the present that happened in the past but comes not in a history book or a picture on National Geographic, but you actually physically see something that occurred 433.8 years ago. See, we see something that was a past event that leads us somewhere now. So something that had happened was leading those ancient mariners in something that was happening, but what had happened was as powerful as if it were happening now. It's all a matter of perspective. And so we see something that was a past event leading us somewhere. Now, when we look at the stars, we're observing history as present reality. So every single day that we look up in the clear sky, we see history as present reality. We are impacted now by something that happened then, and if it hadn't have happened then, it wouldn't happen now, but we benefit now from what happened then. And then you wonder how the cross of Jesus and the resurrection could have an impact on your life now. In the same way that the stars that happened then influence you now, because you see it now in the same way that it happened then. 
If that is true, the question is how far can that truth be carried? What impact can that which happened in the past really have on my life today? How does it work if it does work? My question on that would be, in that concept, have we become more embracing of this effect as a negative principle than a positive one? So our most regular issue with the past is, I was hurt, I was damaged, I was abused, I wasn't given the opportunities I should have had. I wasn't healthy, I wasn't born in the right family, I wasn't born in the right social strata, I wasn't, it's always used as negative, but every one of us understands how negative experiences from the past manifest in the present just as powerfully as they happened in the past. I, I thank God I was never in either an abusive relationship or an abusive family. I was in a very loving family and I've been in loving relationships. But for those of you who have been in abusive relationships or who have been very, very desperately failed by someone in your life from whom you expected something that you never received, you know that what I'm saying is that in the moment, in this moment, it can feel just as if it were happening all over again. The pain can be just the same. Here's another very interesting factor, that something that happened in the past can dictate our health now. So we actually have a physical condition that is the result of an incident that happened in the past. We, in our family, have experienced that. We have witnessed that. I won't go into all the details, but we have watched it happen before our very eyes. Some of you are the same. Things that happened and suddenly something occurred. So here's my issue, that, that in that instance we have no problem recognizing that what happened in the past influences our life now. But you see there's a flip side to that. Because both are true. That as sure as that principle might be negative, there is a positive side to this, that things that have happened can be in our lives now the answer to all that has been the problem, all that has been the issue. <clears throat> so, so, so the question then would be, is this true, this principle of both actions and words? No one can doubt in here tonight the reality that there is power in words. Every one of us has been subject to that. If you were never in a situation where you were failed or abused on a personal level, I can guarantee you there's not one of us in here tonight who has escaped the reality that words that were spoken then of dictating our life now. And again, sadly, most often, those things that dictate our lives are the negative words. The words that said you'll never amount to anything. You're just useless. You know, you, you, you're a failure. You let us down as a family. You know, you destroyed our reputation. All those kind of things that come into our life that, that we carry then through, we seem to have a resistance to hearing the positive words. The good words, the spirit-lifting words, the words that speak life. The question is, to what extent do those words hold power? And also, whether those words have within them the power to create. That's the question. Could it be that all of us have experienced that words that were spoken actually have the power to create. That means to make something, to create something, to bring it out of nothing where it didn't exist, now it exists and it only exists because of the words that were spoken. No one can doubt the reality that there are power in these words. Now the question would be, are there certain arenas in which words create a physical reality. <clears throat> so in the same way that things, events can do it, are there, are there situations where words create a physical 
reality. By that I mean it starts with words, but the end result is something tangible, touchable, feelable, something in the real world, a real event that occurs in our lives because of the words that were spoken. <clears throat> no one can doubt that there is power in events from the past that have happened not just to us but for us, but to what extent can that be harnessed to produce not only a change, but a miracle. Let me take you to just three Bible verses. We get only three verses into the Bible in the book of Genesis. Just three verses, okay? First two verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, okay? That's just... A brief summary of, okay, we've got to start somewhere. But the moment we hit verse 3, three verses into the Bible, you get this massive statement, and God said, right? And God said, you, you mean to tell me that words are not important? When here in this holy book, this, this revelation of the heart of God, we're only three verses in, and we're told, and God said. And in the whole process of creation, and again, don't get hung up, was it a little several days? We've talked about whether it was literal or not literal. I really don't care. What I care about is the principle that into the chaos, into the darkness, into the disorder, God said... And the first thing he said was, let there be light. And it says, and there was light. Or in other words, we have a tangible, touchable, experienceable manifestation that comes from words that are spoken. Words become something. Words become something. And that whole pattern is repeated throughout that First chapter of Genesis. And then in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 63, there's this interesting conversation going on all about Jesus and, and who he is and what his life means and how you can participate in him. And he says these words to the crowd and to his disciples, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. I would propose to you that in all of our words... There is spirit and there is life. Choose your words carefully. Now just because you didn't say it with your mouth but you wrote it on Facebook doesn't mean it wasn't words. Words have within them spirit and life. Do you understand now why they're so damaging? Or so uplifting? Because it's just a word. And what is a word? A word is a sound formed by the tongue and the lips from breathing out. That's all it is. Now we form a language, so we understand the language. That's just our way of deciphering what happened with those formation of the tongue and the lips. But the breath behind them cause something to come out from us, which is life. You cannot live without breath. You cannot speak without breath. I've said before, try holding your breath and saying something at the same time. It's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because breath, or pneuma, as the Greeks called it, or or, or, or ruach, as the Hebrews called it, which are the same words for spirit. Spirit is necessary to speak words. Your words are not only important, they are powerful. And if we look around at our world, most of the issues that exist, exist driven on the back of words, the things that people say. So God used words. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Let me give you one other scripture before we tie this through. In John chapter 1, it says these words, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Does that give you some 
sense of maybe not just how important words are, but the power that exists within words. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Through who? Through the word. So words have an incredible power to make things. Isn't it interesting to think that you have a toolbox on the inside of you that has the power to make things? It can make pain or it can make joy. It can make disaster or it can make miracle. It can make death or it can make life. But it's all coming from that breath, that word that is within you. Everything that was ever made that matters was made through words. I will make a suggestion to you. Everything that will ever be made that matters in your life will be made through words. There are many Bible verses I could take. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, does that mean that God's got an agenda to try and catch you out for how you experience him? No, what he's saying is that when things come through our mouth, when we release things through our mouth, we realize that anything that was ever made that matters is made through words. So the Bible is a book that wants us to use words, okay? It talks in old language about let those who are the redeemed of the Lord, those who know that they're bought, let them say so. Why? Not so God can think, oh, well, I'm glad they've got it. Because when those words come out of you, those words from your mouth carry the same power as those words from God's mouth. If the word had God within him. Because here it's also talking about Jesus. It says, then the word became flesh and lived among us. We saw that word manifest as Jesus. So Jesus was what God was saying. It wasn't just a, a person, a random created being. Jesus was what God is saying. And when you meet Jesus, you meet what God is saying. And as with everything, he's saying more than just the words that you hear. The words that you hear are just the vehicle on which it comes, but it's what's within the words. How many of you have ever heard somebody say something and you came away and said, but I know they didn't mean it? How did you know they didn't mean it? Because the words were the vehicle, but what was behind the words you were really experiencing. Well, Jesus was what God says. And if the word had God within him, why can't my words have God within them? Created in his likeness, created in his image. And because of that, given within human existence the same power that was in God from the beginning, because in the beginning was the word. Isn't it interesting that we as human beings have been given the ability and the opportunity and the power to speak words in the same way that God speaks words. It has to be breath. It has to be spirit. And that's why words are so powerful. So where does believing fit in all of this? Well, that's where I've got my shirt on. There are these equations, word and spirit. <clears throat> that's part of the chemical makeup of what constitutes this thing we know as words. It has spirit in it. But you see, there's another element that goes with the words, that are the two chemical elements that when you mix them together, it creates a reaction. We put two chemical elements together, creates a reaction. Belief is what creates the reaction with word. So if somebody says, you're ugly and you believe it, guess what happens? There is an immediate chemical reaction. You feel embarrassed, you feel condemned. You don't want to go out in public. Why? Because he said, she said, I'm ugly. 
Someone says they hate you. Once you believe that hatred and don't let that hatred go, it's done. I'm, I'm unworthy. Once you believe that, so we attach to words. But the same is also true. That when God speaks life to us, if we will believe what he says about us, the moment we believe it, there is a chemical reaction, and that chemical reaction makes that thing that we have believed a reality. It creates something that is real and tangible in the aspect of life. That's why in the Bible it keeps saying, if you will believe, if you will believe, if you will believe, if you will believe. Why? Because belief is the ingredient you contribute to word to create the chemical reaction. So you can believe negative words or you can believe positive words. You can believe words of death or you can believe words of life. But guess what happens? The words that you believe are the ones that become real, first of all, in your heart and your life. And here's the first thing that they do. They remove fear. Why do they remove fear? Because you experience love in the words that you believed and fear is removed. Perfect love drives out fear because there's no fear in love because fear has to do with punishment but punishment has to do with judgment. Judgment has to do with accusation. Accusation comes from people who speak words. So when we prepare to believe the good words that God has spoken over humanity and he's spoken more good words than bad words. In fact, I would argue that most of the bad words came from what people thought God should have said had he been given the choice to say it in the way that they would have liked him to have said it. And so Jesus comes on the scene and says, in him was life and that life was the light of men. Oh, hang on. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, la, 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 and God said, let there be light. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The creative power that comes through the word of God always brings life. Always, always, always. And if you say, well, I don't have much life, because you're believing the wrong word. And instead of something that happened in history revealing itself now to you to give you direction and blessing, it's causing you pain and confusion. Another word you might use in there is the word faith. Faith is the determined placement of my belief and trust in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Faith is not believing if God judges me, it'll be okay in the end because I'm just believing he'll have mercy on me. That's not faith. Faith is the determined placement of belief and trust in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. When you believe those words, that's when the chemical reaction happens. So let's, let's bring this through to where we can have communion. So, Although Jesus died on the cross, he was speaking life to humanity. He was not speaking life because he was saying, you scumbags, if you'd have been better, I wouldn't have had to go through this, but I guess I've just got to put up with the pain and the horror of all this, all because you failed. No, no. Blood was the currency of covenant. Covenant is in old terms an unbreakable promise of which you become a beneficiary. When Jesus gave his life on the cross, he used the currency of covenant. In other words, he was making a promise to himself of which you would become the beneficiary. Here was that promise, life, life, life. Wholeness, health, completeness, wisdom, understanding, life, 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 what do you think it means when he said, I have come that you might have life in all its fullness, right? Not just life where you kind of at least, you know, you, you just keep breathing for a little longer. Life in all its fullness means in all those aspects 
he was bringing his life. And when Jesus gave his life on the cross, he was literally giving his life. He didn't say, I am the bread of death. Or I am the bread of, well, if only you haven't messed up. I am the bread of, well, I'll kind of feel a bit better about it. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will live. There's life in this. So, so, so everything about this speaks life. It speaks life. But the issue is also we have an opportunity to do the same. To speak life. And the problem is the problem. And that problem is this. We're speaking death all the time. We're speaking negativity. We speak condemnation. We speak guilt. We speak stuff all the time. And guess what? We believe it. We believe there'll never be a way to resolve that problem. We believe this will never be fixed in me. And so the belief and the word comes together and creates a chemical reaction. What if we started to believe something different because we're hearing something different that comes from the Lord of life, that's saying life to it, life to it. What if we hear the cry of the resurrection? I was dead, but now I am alive, and I live forevermore. In other words, there's nothing more substantial that we as humans will ever face than death itself, that Jesus said, okay, everything from there to death itself and destruction, I have defeated it, I am risen from the dead, and I offer my life to you. When we start to believe those words, it is my conviction, and when we start to speak those words, not only to our own spirit, but also to one another, guess what happens? As those words start to be believed, we create a chemical reaction with each other. Speak life. So here's, here's just a few, few things to finish it off. When you speak life, it's not confined within, nor restricted by the confines of a moment. So why would God's words, or Jesus' words then, be confined? See, we confine our words within a moment. But remember our North Star that spoke 433 light years ago, 433 years ago, sorry, 433.8 years ago. And we hear it speaking today. It says, this is where you go if you want to head north. We're hearing it speak today. Why? Because when you speak life, it's not confined nor restricted to the confines of the moment. Because the problem is so many of you want to speak life, but say, well, hang on, I speak life. Oh, it's not fixed. Okay, I'll speak life, I'll try harder. Oh, it's not fixed. No, you have to understand once you speak life, it's not bound within the confines of the moment. And God's words are not bound within the confines of the moment. So whatever he said about this is real now. We are not just celebrating the Last Supper. We are participating in that supper the life in that bread touched by Jesus is the life that's in this bread now. The life that was in that wine, drunk by those disciples, is what's in this wine now. It's the same life because it's not confined. What I'm trying to encourage you with that is that when you receive a miracle and you begin to speak life, those words are not confined within that moment that you spoke those words. They go beyond that moment and start to do something. If God's word changed things from the beginning in time and space, why would words cease to do that now? Why shouldn't you have a miracle? Because the words in the beginning weren't confined in time and space. They changed things in time and space. Why wouldn't they do that now? Chemicals and ingredients react according to what they're coupled with. So what are you coupling them with? Words coupled with belief and faith create a spirit reaction. Jesus' words at that first communion have the power to create a dynamic spirit reaction that is saturated with resurrection power. And that's why we're doing this on a Saturday night and inviting all of you to take of it wherever you came from, 
whatever you've done. The qualification is not yours, the qualification is his. He said, this is my table, you come and eat at my table. Not you make a table for me, I'll make a table for you. Do you get that? Don't create a table for me, I'll create a table for you. And King David said he'll do it in the presence of my enemies as well. So when Jesus said, this bread is my body, broken for you, he was talking as specifically to you here tonight as he was to the disciples around that table. When he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, he was saying it just as specifically to you tonight as he was saying it to those disciples back then. So what's our response? Pull up a chair. Okay. Pull up a chair. You're welcome. But that's not the only response I want. And speak life. Speak life. Speak life. Because when those words and belief connect together, boom, chemical reaction, a manifestation within the realm of time and space that the Bible calls miracle. It can be your miracle. It can be our miracle. But it comes from those words being connected to belief. I'd like us to make a commitment tonight that we're going to be very cautious about negative words. And to make a commitment that as far as possible, however we can get ourselves there, we're going to speak life in every situation because those words will not be confined within the boundaries of some small arena, but will go beyond. So, we're going to take uh, communion. I'll tell you how we're going to do it. The guys are coming in. Um, I'm going to run on the screen, saving our guys, um, the song that I put on at the end of my message last week. Because the whole song is about speak life. Um, for some people, it would be like, well, it's not melancholic enough for, you know, a communion. But this is not melancholic, okay? This is, this is God's word. It's, it's the Jesus who says it's finished. It's the one who says, I dare you to believe me. I dare you to believe what I've said about life, about you, about the miraculous, about God's heart towards you. So, so we're going to run that in the background while we, while we come. I'll read you just a few words from that, and then I'll, I'll tell you how we're organized. Okay, it says, lift your head a little higher. Lift your head a little higher. That's important. Lift your head a little higher. How many of you ever told when you were a kid, lift your head up when you're talking to me? Why? Because you mumble. And usually, how many of you know, we, we call it talking under your breath. Whenever we do that, I'm talking under your breath, really, you're having a little, well, I don't really. Lift your head a little higher. Stop muttering. Stop mumbling about life. Lift your head a little higher. Speak clearly, speak confidently, but speak words of life. Spread the love like fire. Hope will fall like rain. When you speak life with the words you say, raise your thoughts a little higher. Use your words to inspire. Joy will fall like rain when you speak life with the things you say. To the deadest, darkest night, speak life. When the sun won't shine, and you don't know why, look into the eyes of the brokenhearted. Watch them come alive as soon as you speak hope. You speak love. You speak, you speak life. So as we invite you to come tonight, I, I, I want you to hear that God is speaking life over you. He's speaking life over you. To every area that's dead, he's speaking life. To every issue, to every situation, is speaking life. And what he asks for you when you come and receive these communion emblems is not that you try harder, do more. He just asks that you believe. And the challenges you come to receive tonight is will you believe the God who from the beginning has been speaking life over you of which Jesus was him having to shout because we weren't listening. Jesus was God shouting, life to you, life. What do I have to do? Believe. Why? Because when belief 
and words come together, the reaction takes place, and I want that reaction for you tonight to be life in every area of your being. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use our little system again because we could get congestion. So this section here, we'll start over here where Tom is and you guys, you'll be the first ones to come. All of you on this side of the divide, I need you to go out the door and come all the way around. And these guys, go back to your seat by doing that. So we've got a, a rotation here. We'll start. We've got Sarah and Joel. We'll start here. So this side... Come this way. You guys on this side of the divide, you'll start filing out that way and coming all the way around. So everybody's on a one-way system. Okay, the stewards, the stewards will help you. The same here. Jenny's serving, so we'll start Graham here and, and Jenny. You guys will come out here. Those that side of the divide, you go out that way and come all the way around and up the aisle. Go back the same way. Is that clear? No. But we're going to do it anyway. So... I'm speaking life to you. So you don't get your grandma crushed on the way out. So Jenny's going to be over here. This will be the first station. You can get your bread here. And then when, you, when you've had the bread, Jenny will just speak life over you. Go and get your, get, your, get your, it's juice. So don't worry, anybody. Get your juice over there and then off you go. I'm going to be down here. So I'll serve here. Chris is going to be over here. But we're just going to thank God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That words of life are dripping over us right now. Words that bring health, that bring freedom, that bring forgiveness, that bring release from guilt, that bring release from shame. Words of life that restore us, that put us back to where we were before we were dumb enough to get where we got. Words that restore Words that bring us back to life. Words that put life in place of death. And so I just bless the people of this house today, Father, as we come and as we receive. So we're going to run the song up there and we're going to go ahead and speak a word of life. You believe and you receive and you see what God will do in your own heart and life. If you're gluten-free, can you tell us, please? Because we're very modern. We even have... Just like Jesus said, this bread is my body and this is gluten bread for any of you disciples, gluten free that, that require it. So we bless you, you can begin to come right now, they're gonna run the video. All right, while we're just, uh, while we're just finishing, you can, leave that, you can leave that running, that's fine. Uh, how many of you uh, are old enough to have watched the show on TV, um, Catchphrase, remember Catchphrase? on catchphrase where they did all the little pictures and you had to guess what it was. They used a phrase, and I want to finish with this. The phrase was, say what you see. So the key was, say what you see. I, I want to challenge you that when you grab this, it becomes see what you say. That's how powerful this is. See what you say, okay? I want to challenge you to get a hold of this because as you believe it, you will begin to see what you say. So speak life. Speak life. Speak life. Yeah? All right. Bless you. We're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.